Hi, this is Scott. I really appreciate our sponsors because they make the show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Telerik. Create compelling app experiences across any screen with the Telerik platform. Telerik's end-to-end platform uniquely combines industry-leading UI tools with cloud services to simplify the entire app development cycle. Telerik offers everything .NET developers need to build quality apps faster. Try it free at telerik.com slash platform. That's telerik.com slash platform. From HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 505. In this episode, Scott talks with iFixit CEO and co-founder Kyle Weems about the importance of fixing your own consumer electronics. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today, we're talking with Kyle Weens. He's the co-founder and CEO of iFixit.com and a big fan of not wasting technology, fixing it, being empowered, aren't you? Absolutely. I, our goal in life is to make everything that you've got last as long as possible. Yeah. So iFixit is, it's a, it's a free repair guide. It's, uh, it's not quite the Wikipedia of repair, but it is the place that I go when I have a device that it needs to be fixed. I've gone there to find, uh, you know, which capacitor burned out in my Nintendo 3DS. I've uh, replaced screens on Android phones. Uh, w- how did this start? Yeah, we're getting pretty close to being the Wikipedia. We are working our way incrementally. We're adding, uh, I mean, thousands of new th- new things every year. Uh, so we got started when I was uh, trying to repair my iBook. I dropped it on the power plug, and I had I knew I just had a cracked solder joint. If I kind of held the power plug just right, I could get in and fix it. And so I started trying to take it apart, and I realized very quickly that the process of pulling the thing apart was much more challenging than I was expecting. There were lots of little plastic tabs and latches, and just the process of taking this thing apart was complicated. So I did what anybody would do. I Googled it, and I couldn't find a repair manual or repair information for it available anywhere. Uh, and I thought this was crazy. And so I went ahead and I kind of muddled my way through the repair. And then I said, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be, you know, somebody has to do something. And I realized nobody was going to do anything about it. So I took it apart again. I took pictures and we posted them online. And that was the beginning. And then I did a little bit more research and I learned that Apple has proactively been sending cease and desist letters to anybody that shares their repair manuals. Uh, so once we realized that, it kind of turned into a bit of a religious crusade where we said, we're going to make sure that there's repair information online for everything. Wow. Does, has Apple sent you nasty grams asking you to stop? We're very good at copyright law. And so we haven't really pushed the envelope with them on that. We make sure that everything that we do, we own the copyright to or our community owns the copyright. And uh, so there's nothing they can do. It's just like, you know, lifting the hood on your car and taking pictures. Mm-hmm. And that's an interesting analogy, like lifting hood and lifting the hood in your car and taking pictures. That that is our right. Like it should be our right as consumers to open a device up and mess with it. Should it not? I absolutely think so. And there's something about society moving away from an engineering culture where we we, we shifted from being a culture of makers to we're, we're just consumers. And so you know they hand us a shiny iPod or a new Galaxy, and they say this is it. It's pristine. It's going to work. Uh, until it stops, and then you'll come to us and we'll give you a new one, or we'll sell you a new one. Uh, and I don't think that that teaches the right kind of societal uh, structure that we want. I think that if, if we understand how to get inside and tinker with things, uh, we're going to be better people, we're going to be better consumers. You know, some people have taken me to task and said that it's not necessarily in the personalities of everyone to to know that one additional layer of abstraction, right? Like, I always talk about, like, driving an automatic versus driving a, a stick shift. Mm-hmm. You know, of course, the U.S., it, this is speaking kind of ethnocentrically, the U.S. is becoming a a country of people who drive automatics. Right. There's still, everyone else on the planet drives manual shift. But when I got a car, you know, in the, in the 80s, in the late, early 90s, it was part of the requirement that I also know how to change the oil. Like, that was how I was taught. My mom and dad said, you won't drive a car until you can successfully, you know, change the oil. And, and just literally just today, uh, my wife had a, a flashing light 
on her car had a uh, low tire, you know, and I, I fixed it and I, and she didn't understand how to do it. And I realized that it wasn't in the culture that she grew up in to, to know that. Right. How far, how far down should people go? Like, I mean, I don't think everyone should necessarily know how to solder, but they should be able to pop something open. There's a spectrum. We find once you get inside and you do a repair, you kind of get hooked and you start to understand things. I mean, mm. you imagine being stuck on the side of the road, the road. It's amazing how many people can't change a tire if they're stuck on the side of a road. And so you see somebody stuck and you pull over and you're like, hey, can I change your tire for you? And they're like, oh, that'd be amazing. I don't have any idea how to do this. It's Well, you've put yourself in the position where you're helpless. And I think as consumers, we get in a situation where we don't know how to, say, change the battery in a phone and we're allowing the manufacturers to make us helpless. It seems like they're not just trying to make us helpless, but they are going out of their way to, like, are there engineering reasons for them to make these things so hard to open? There are always design constraints when you get get into these things. So if you're a product designer, an industrial designer, just like in software, we start out with our requirements and then we set out to build the best product that meets the requirements. Product designers are given business requirements. They say, this is approximately the battery life that we're going for. This is the thickness that we're going for. This is whether we care or not about repairability. Uh, at Dell, their designers are given the clear mandate that the products must be designed to be easy to disassemble, easy to repair, uh, easy to recycle. And that's part of the design process. You know, it's interesting that you call out Dell because at least 15 years ago, when every machine that I had was a Dell desktop, you know, they were always known for being easy to open. They had the easy finger uh, nuts and bolts. You know, you didn't even need a screwdriver to open up a Dell and right. and do stuff with it. Right. Well, and Dell has serviceability engineers who have veto power over product designs. So they'll get a design from the industrial design team, and they take a look at it. And uh, if if things are too challenging to open, they get a they get a push back and say, "No, you need to try again." Uh, and, and on the other side, Dell actually takes their designers, their industrial design team, to recycling facilities, and they pull apart their products at least once a year to get a feel for what the end of life of these products looks like. See, that seems like a really good thing and a really responsible thing, but not to get too political, but one could argue Dell is not winning. Right. Uh, certainly on the tablet front, they're not winning. Uh, and I'm not sure that it's the that it's the products that are a challenge for them or or if it's a marketing thing. Yeah. Um, I recently uh, went and bought some stuff from iFixit and I went to the repair guide and I replaced the screen on an Android S3. And I realized that this is probably pretty simple. You know, this is maybe in the lower to middle difficulty thing, mm -hmm. but it did involve a heat gun, which uh, I must admit, and I apologize for admitting this publicly, I did not know that that was a thing <laughs> until I did this. You know, like, you know, I... <laughs> It's There's like a, a hair dryer that heat. sets your hair on fire. Yeah, it immediately <laughs> sets your hair on fire. Uh, <laughs> but it was so harrowing. It was so scary to take the screen off of this thing because the I didn't realize, but there's an optically bonded glue behind the screen. Right. And I had to pull the thing off with a with a wire. I felt like I was like a like an assassin trying to garret someone. <laughs> um, yeah. But it was so powerful. I think I actually replaced it, and it looks really good. Right. Well, and this is something, you know, we come out with our repairability scores when the product comes out, and sometimes people give us a hard time, and specifically the display and the optical and uh, digitizer being bonded together was something where people said, oh, well, you you know, you dinged at a whole point for that issue, and we say, well, you know, we just spent six hours taking the cell phone apart, and we have the, like, cuts and bruises to show for it. Like, if it got a low score, uh, we worked very, very hard in the process of figuring out how to pull it apart. Honestly, the lower the repair score, the harder the teardown is for us. Yeah, I ended up spending probably two hours on that. You gave the S3 a repairability of 8 out of 10, because for the most part, the back pops off and it's pretty easy to get. Right. But when you get into the front glass, you know, yeah. it says difficulty, difficult. Yeah, well, and, and the repair score was assuming that you'd be replacing the entire display assembly, which is a much more expensive the repair than what you did, where you just replaced the digitizer. Yeah, valid point. For me, the phone was only, uh, was like I said, it was an S3, so it was worth about $100, and right. the screen was going to cost me about $100. So I put 15 bucks into it. Right. Not counting yes. the the repair stuff that I got from you guys, which I use now all the time, every day. 
Right. And this is the case across most phones. So you have the, you have the digitizer, which is the touch screen that you, you touch. And then you have the, the LCD and they are bonded together. Sometimes they're not at all. One's just set on top of the other and there's a, there's an air gap. Uh, and then on, on a lot of the newer devices, they're extremely tightly, uh, fused together. And you can't even do it with, with, I mean, what, what you did with the Galaxy S3 with just a, a small wire, uh, with the newer devices, you have to have an even finer molybdenum wire to be able to get it apart. Mm-hmm. Why are we moving in this direction of things being not fixable? Is it is it laziness? I mean, like if you look at like the Surface Book or the Surface Pro, uh, they really just aren't easy to fix, are they? You tear them down and they're not going back together. Yeah, Microsoft's design team has really decided that it's not a priority for them, uh, which I think is fascinating because the Xbox team has really decided that repairability is something that matters to them, and both the uh, both the the new Xbox One and the uh, the Sony uh, PlayStation are are pretty easy and straightforward to repair. The controllers are straightforward and easy to repair. So the Surface team is kind of off doing their own thing. Hmm. Um, you know, I think an interesting case study right now are the two new Nexus phones. You've got the 5X uh, that's made by LG, and then you have the 6P that's made by Huawei. Uh, and they're, you know, two Nexus phones are the two flagship phones right now uh, from Google's side, and they both came out at the same time. Mm-hmm. One is very, very easy to repair. The LG phone is very straightforward, got a great repairability score, and the Huawei is terrible. So what's what's the deal? How do we have – I mean, this is a tale of two phones. Mm-hmm. I think – I think that there, are, it, it just comes down to the design philosophy of, of the, the team and what are the constraints that you have going into it. LG has won some awards recently for how easy to disassemble their devices are and their design team has made it a priority. It's mm. always easier to glue things together. It's cheaper to manufacture them and, and, and it's easier to get, get durability. Um, but I think it's almost the lazy way out. I don't mm-hmm. think if you're to look at the quality of, of the 5X and say, oh, it's, it's a lower quality phone or it's thicker than the 6P. Uh, it's just the design team, I think, tried harder on the 5X. Mm-hmm. I've, I've heard that some of these phones, when you open them up, they are literally just swimming in glue. Like they're, they're filled with glue almost like it's in a kind of insulation. Well, and that's an easy way to put things together. Uh, if you think about, you know, you have a case, you can, you can have a robot squirt glue in, you can slap the battery in. Uh, it's, it's very, uh, straightforward to, uh, accomplish a lot of things. It, it improves thermal stability. It improves torsional rigidity. It makes the, the device hold together better if you drop it. It's easier to pass some of the drop tests. So glue absolutely is, is an easy way out. Uh, it, it's just, I think it's, it's a little bit of design laziness. It's a, it's kind of like having a function that's a thousand lines long. Like you can do it, but it's not necessarily a great idea. Is it easy for them? Like I know when I go take my iPhone in uh, to the Apple store and a genius looks at it, they disappear, you know, into the back somewhere and they do something and they always come back faster than I know I could. Do they have some special suction cups or something back there? Or are they like, yeah. Yeah, so the iPhone is an interesting case where the iPhone scores really highly in our in our scores. Uh, and you'll note they're not going to take a iPad with a cracked screen back and show it back up very quickly. So they don't have any fancy, fast way to repair iPads. Uh, so Apple's kind of the same thing. The iPad design team has decided to make a product that is very challenging to repair. The iPhone design team has decided to make something that's very easy to repair. So in, in the case of the iPhones, it's two screws on the bottom. They do have a fancy suction cup thing, but we sell something that's pretty similar. Mm-hmm. Um, and you suction cup the thing open. You can swap the screen, uh, crack screen, replace the display assembly in an iPhone 6 or 6S in five minutes easy. Was the, uh, the 6 a d- d- departure? Like I seem to remember iPhones in the 4 and 5 range being hard to open. Yeah, so they went through some kind of transitions where the question is, is it more important to be able to swap the battery or the screen uh, on the device. Mm-hmm. So on the four, you pop the back off and it was very straightforward to get the battery, but then right. the screen was really, really hard to get to. Okay. And then on the iPhone, uh, five, they, they, they flipped it around, um, uh-huh. and, and they actually made it easy to get both the screen and the batteries. So you pop the screen up and then you can access both. Uh-huh. Then with the five S, they added a, uh, a, the touch sensor and they added a little cable that made it hard to pop the screen open without accidentally breaking that cable. Um, and then with the six, they said, oh, this was a problem. And they actually went and uh, routed that around to make the repair easier. And they kept that design with the 6S. Mm-hmm. So yeah, what was... we have seen is that they have been incrementally making the iPhone easier to repair over time. Well, it seems like probably because the longer it's been around, 
people are you know, they're realizing that this thing's going to live a while. This is certainly not a disposable thing. It's a pocket supercomputer. Uh, and I know for a fact that after a year, if you charge these things every day, battery life suffers. Like, I, I am one of the people who doesn't think about battery conditioning. I plug the thing in at night right. and I unplug it in the morning. And that's so, completely reasonable. You know, right? Totally reasonable thing to do. 400 battery cycles later, and I have an iPhone that shuts off at 30%. Right. Uh, and I'm going to go in there and I'm going to say, you guys better fix this, uh, fix this battery. Right. And they say the battery is not covered under warranty. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so, you know, they have a battery replacement policy. I think they say $79 and we'll do it on our schedule or you can mail it to us and pay us mm-hmm. for shipping and handling. We're, we say, Hey, here's a battery. It's 20 bucks or 25 bucks and sell mm-hmm. it your own, your own time. It's not going to take that long. Um, so that's certainly a better experience. And I mean, battery life, people don't realize lithium batteries generally last about 400 charge cycles. Uh, if you have kind of more thermal leveling on it, some of the MacBooks, they'll, they'll last a thousand charge cycles. Uh, but that's it. At, the, at that point, it's, it's worn out. It's just like the tires on your car wears out. You need to replace it. And they wear out. Like when they wear out, they wear out, you know? I, right. uh, I was, uh, running around, uh, Europe a couple weeks ago and it happened to be really, really cold. And I had the weirdest thing happen. I'm looking <laughs> at my iPhone, the battery's at 31%. And then I look down and it's at 1%. Yeah. And then I look down and it's off. That's off. Yeah. But yesterday, yeah. in sitting in front of my fire, That's sitting in front funny. of the fire on, I ran that thing all the way down to one and it sat at 1% for almost an hour. Yeah. What was the deal? Well, batteries are very thermally sensitive and you hear about this with, with the Tesla Model S. If you, if you see anybody that has problems with the Model S, they're probably in a northern climate. Mm. Uh, the batteries do not do as well in, in cold weather. Um, and that's just a electrons move slower in a material that, that, uh, you know, is less conductive and the colder these things get, it's, it's just more of a, of a challenge chemically. Um, I had my iPhone 4S, um, I had it for 11 months and I, you know, was charging it like twice a day. Mm-hmm. And after 11 months, the battery was just done. The phone would go into a boot loop and it just would never charge enough, uh, to be able to power the phone. So 11 months in, like I'm within the warranty, but the battery isn't covered under warranty. So battery is, is something it's, it's, mm. it's regular maintenance. It's like changing the oil in your car. Of course you should be changing the batteries on these things every so often indeed and in and, and that's the other thing that makes me think about the uh the longevity of these devices i went and got a couple of speak and spells for my kids mm-hmm. and when i opened them up the only thing i had to do was clean them out because they were full of battery acid i uh, had a couple of etches in the you know that weren't good you know and i just tidied up a little bit it was mostly a cleaning operation then i popped in some c batteries and then my kids are off but then a fast forward and I found some devices that were, had internal batteries. They were NICAD batteries, but they had just been sitting there forever. And it seemed like there was something that needed to have power to receive power. You know, like some of these devices, you'd get them. I remember what it was. It was a, um, remember that HP $99 tablet that everyone was freaking out about that ran, right. uh, yes. like WebOS? Yes. Turns out if you run that thing dead, that's it because it has to have power to charge. Wow. That's a, that's some bad power engineering. Uh, it should, sh- should be viable. I mean, a lot of times they'll put a little capacitor in there that you can charge up and. I'm sure that there's a way to open it up and jump, you know, give it a jump start. Right. But it, it, it gave me this idea that like, gosh, there must, there are some devices out there, especially ones that have that kind of wireless charging that, that really don't want to charge. I've got an old, um, Microsoft spot watch that was one of the first watches that would sit on something and, and, and charge. Is that, was that the word capacitively? Uh, yes. Uh, well, inductively. Inductively, yeah. rather. Pardon me. Uh, and it, it won't charge anymore. Like, I would need to give it a, a little bit of a CPR if I want to bring it back. Right. Well, and so I think this is a question for, you know, the, the engineers of the world is how, how do we, we as consumers are really bad at making these kind of decisions up front. Like no one who was thinking about buying an HP WebOS tablet was mm-hmm. thinking about these, these end of life battery issues at the time. I mean, I bought one and I didn't know about it at the time. Mm-hmm. So, but it's clearly in the best interest of society. It's in the best interest of the environment for us to be making these decisions at purchase time and really factoring these things in. But none of the product reviewers know about it. The only people that really might know are, are some folks in the, in the engineering test departments of these companies and they aren't going to say anything. So we have to make a decision up front on whether to buy something, whether the support manufacturers that are doing the right thing or the wrong thing. Uh, and we don't have the information to make that decision. And, and moreover, as I and you upgrade to the next iPhone, it's, I think, 
it's just not environmentally irresponsible, just regular irresponsible to put the old iPhone in a drawer. Right. Yeah. So if you look at globally, the number of phones that we manufacture, it was about 1.6 billion phones last year. It's going to be close to 2 billion phones uh, for, for 2015. And the question is, how many phones should we be manufacturing? Um, so I, I, I would like to, to limit, you know, to, to have that plateau and say, we're going to make a certain number of phones every year. This is the environmental footprint that we expect the electronics industry to have. But also let's think about all the people around the world that sure would love to have an iPhone and just are never going to be able to afford a brand new phone from Apple. The best way to make the iPhone affordable to folks in Africa is to make sure that all the phones that we have now are still functional six or eight years from now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, certainly in that case, uh, you're using Africa in the metaphorical sense. There's people all over the world that don't have these smartphones. I like to actually, when I have a phone, replace the battery, and then I give it to somebody. Right. So if I, I have an iPhone 4S, it's a perfectly good phone. I spent the 20 bucks. I swap it out. I replace the battery. I literally refresh the phone, and then I pay it forward. Right. Give it to a relative. Uh, you know, it was running around wherever you wherever your your travels are. If someone can use a phone like that, you know, definitely pass it on. Exactly, exactly. I think I think that's a, a great perspective. And getting a new battery into these things frequently is the most important part of it. Well, and this would be a good challenge, just challenge for the listeners, right? So if if you're listening, right, people who are listening to this podcast, both of you, um, <laughs> go to iFixit, click on devices, pick your phone, and. This is an opportunity for you. If you've, if you've never opened up a phone, do this now. After this podcast, go and get those two or three phones that you know you have an S3 in your, in your kitchen. Pop that thing open. Those are easy. Get an iPhone, get an, get an iPhone, pop it open, get a spudger. What's a spudger? Why do I need a spudger? Spudger is a small blast, plastic pry tool. It's just a nice non-metal tool for prying things open. Yeah, I learned that the, the hard way when I <laughs> <laughs> tried to use a, a, a screwdriver to, to open up an iPhone. Uh, and, you know, take your iPhone, take your iPad. You know, I actually gave an, an original iPad to my 94-year-old aunt. It is her most favorite device ever, you know. And and, and with, with a good battery, it's going to run for a very, very long time. Right. She loves it. Right. Still browses the net great. Absolutely. Yep, and she just likes random stuff on Facebook <laughs> for Which no is reason. Great. Yeah, it is great. G- good for her. Yeah, now, no, I completely agree. And this is something, I mean, we have we have repair guides for so many things mm-hmm. that, I mean, we have over 500 different Android devices, complete disassembly procedures, how to change the display, how to change mm-hmm. the battery, how to fix a headphone jack, you name it, across across a huge variety of products. Mm-hmm. Now, I know that you, you don't, you won't, uh, uh, you know, sully your nails by uh, talking about how great your store is, but I will because I am an actual fan. This is not, uh, not sponsored, but, uh, if you go to ifix.com slash store, they've got these, uh, these toolkits you can get. There's like the smartphone repair kit, which is at one level. And then there's the pro tech toolkit and it moves its way up to this. Like if you run a repair business, like I've got a good friend, uh, named brother tech. It's Terrence Gaines, brother BR. O T H A tech, brothertech.com. Check him out. He's got like the toolkit, right? It's the complete everything you need to fix tech stuff. Now I went and got the pro tech toolkit, which has got a half dozen spudgers and it's got, you know, tiny little tweezers and all the things that I need to fix stuff around the house. But my most favorite thing, and I'm, I'm, I'm gushing about it because it's just so cool. Everyone comments on it. It's sitting right here. It is the, the magnetic project mat. So it's basically like a magnetic whiteboard with gridded, with gridded, um, with lines, with a grid line. So then you just take the, take the, uh, screw off of the thing you're taking apart. You put it onto the mat. It's magnetic. It sticks to it and you just scribble what the thing is. I use this thing all the time. It is brilliant. The magnetic project mat was something when we first started making it, I was thinking, oh, that's nice. That'll be useful every once in a while if you have a hard project. It is amazing. When you get into these small devices, organization is like 90% of the battle. Uh, there are so many tiny screws, and you might not even be able to visibly see the difference between a millimeter and a 1.5 millimeter screw, but that can be <laughs> the difference between putting it back together and having it work or not. The mm-hmm. tolerances in these things are tiny. So you have to have a repair guide and you have to be very methodical about it. And the cool thing about the grid on the mat is you can have each grid can be a different step in the guide. So you just number the grids as you go. You put the all the screws from step two in box two and you're good. 
Yep. There's a really great, uh, under the product images, when you click on the Pro Magnetic Project Mat, there's like this really great image. And it's very realistic because it's clear that you're using it. And it's like, this part goes in first. You know, uh, I do this all the time, taking apart uh, like old Dell laptops. Old Dell laptops are really great devices, like the ones they made in the last five to ten years. You can always fix them but they've got a million screws and they're all different sizes. Uh, right. This has saved me a number of times. When did you all move from repair guides to, to parts and tools store? Was that just the next obvious step? Yeah, it kind of was. Cause we, we had the, we had the manuals and then people were saying, well, I can't fix it. It's, it's great that you told me how to fix it, but I can't get the parts for it. And so then we started searching around and I mean, when we were starting like Wikipedia, it, I, I mean, Jimmy Wales and the folks that are, they're running Wikipedia are really my heroes. Mm-hmm. And so we were saying, well, we need to run, we, the world needs a repair manual for everything. How can we fund it? And I know that in December of every year, Jimmy puts his face on Wikipedia and that works for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was trying to figure out a way I didn't have to put my face on. I fix it every December. <laughs> <laughs> and beg for donations. And so we said, well, maybe we can sell parts and tools. And so we, we kind of yeah. turned it into a complete solution where the repair manual is free. Creative Commons licensed will always be that way. Uh, and then, and then if you want, you can buy the parts and tools from us. And that helps us pay our programmers and keep the lights on. That is a really good, really good solution. It is almost like the open source solution where you, you charge for one thing, but you give lots away. Right. So the repair guides are Creative Commons. And uh, how many of them are written by your folks versus the community? Yeah, it's mostly the community. The last time I looked, we'd written something like 15% of the guides on the site. But mm-hmm. people are constantly coming to me and saying, hey, do you have a repair manual for a toilet or for an oscilloscope? And I say, I don't know. I, I learned because I, I used to say, no, we don't have a repair manual for that. And then I would look on the site and I say, oh, shucks, we actually do have an oscilloscope guide. So <laughs> now I just tell people to, to Google it because I don't even know. I mean, we've got yeah, instructions on like somebody put like a real helicopter. There's some component of the of the rotary assembly, and they put repair guides for that on there. Um, there we have for a certain Mercedes chassis. Our service manual now is more comprehensive than the OEM Mercedes manual. Wow! So when when I went to repair guides, you know, I saw the things I expected. You know, tablet, phone, PC. Then I saw car and truck, and then if you go to even farther down, you've got 140 different appliances down there you got household stuff uh so you're not you know music there's a whole section on musical instruments you're not intending to just be about phones and stuff you've got everything. fix its mission is to teach everyone in the world how to fix all of their things mm-hmm. and we take that very seriously and we're comprehensive across the board we have we have uh i mean all kinds of vehicles there's a specific moped i think it's a 1978 moped uh and somebody took it apart posted a guide and then other people came on and started asking questions about it and it's evolved and now we're the number one place that you go if you have this 1978 moped all the people on the internet trying to fix these things are on i fix it mm-hmm. so you've got teardowns you've got fix it guides but you've also got kind of a support question it's kind of a stack overflow for repair yes kind of thing and so this is stack overflow for repair i know jeff uh atwood very well and as we were building this i was talking with him and i said hey you know i was going to build up my own thing but what you guys did is so amazing can i like flat out copy it and tweak it for repair and he said yes absolutely please do oh wow so uh, answers is I mean it, it's a it's a Q&A forum it's device centric so where stack overflow is organized around tags I fix is organized around products. So I'm I'm pretty sure there is no question about an iPhone 5 that you're going to have that is not already answered on the site. Very cool. Um, oh. And it goes across the board. We have people, they, Atari 2600. Hey, you know, my Atari 2600 stopped working. Can I fix it? Like people are actively still repairing these things. There are new questions that come in all the time, even on vintage hardware like that. Yeah, there is. Uh, I'm looking here right now at the Atari 2600 repair and you've got teardowns. Now, who does the teardowns? Is that also, is that also the community? Uh, the most high profile teardowns, so the ones that you usually see on the news are done by us. Uh, but mm-hmm. the latest teardown that's on the site is a Sony Xperia Z5 that was written by a community member. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were so busy getting ready for the iPad Pro this week that, that Lenka beat us to it. So that's great. How often, I'm just curious, because I think we all see these teardown things and we're like, oh no, I can't believe they took apart that 
expensive thing. How often do you get them back together again? And how often do you just have to throw them away? Well, it depends on if it's a Microsoft Surface or not. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the devices we definitely get back together and we use like uh, in our teardown room, we have an Amazon Echo. Uh, that's the Echo that we use for the teardown. And that's our, uh-huh. that's our music device. So absolutely, we get most of the things back together. Some stuff that's super challenging, like the Surface, you know, Humpty Dumpty might not be able to put the Surface back together again. So you failed to reassemble the Surface in some way. There were just Surface parts. Uh, yeah, the Surface parts floating around. I mean, one of them, I mean, even I think the Surface 3 we got back together when we were we were using it. I don't mm-hmm. know that we tried to put the Surface Book back together. That was just... Uh, that was just last week. So there's um, the Surface Pro and the Surface Book. The Book is the one with the fancy hinge. Correct. And that's a pretty elegant machine. And that, that was a long teardown. That was a long day. Yeah. Um, that look, it's, you, there's like, a, I'm looking here at step 30. Yes. 30 different steps. And I assume and that, that was pulling means both is, of them apart. Really? Yeah. Now, now one thing to note. So the, uh, even though our teardowns and our repair guides are in the same format, we, we listed 30 steps for the teardown, but that's more like telling the story of how we took it apart. It's mm. not a good idea to follow a teardown to do an actual repair. So I when see. we go to actually write the Surface Book uh, repair manual, it will be far more than 30 steps long. Mm-hmm. Have you ever not been able to get something open without breaking it? Uh, yeah, we break stuff. Absolutely. I mean, the original iPad, well, the iPad 2, we broke. Um, we broke the first, like, five or six iPad 2s that we took apart. Um, I think the original couple surfaces, I don't know, did we, did we break this in the process of pulling it apart? I'm looking at the surface book. I don't, I don't think we, so this one we managed to get intact. Uh Um, it really, uh, depends on the product. Um, like the, uh, so the iPod shuffles are a disposable product and I don't think Mm -hmm. it's possible to disassemble those without breaking them. Um, the new Apple's new keyboards and mice have integrated batteries and I don't know that it's possible to pull those apart without Mm -hmm. irrevocably damaging them. We've gotten pretty good at it. Uh, but it's, it's really the design that we're up against more than anything else. If it's possible to disassemble it, usually we can do it the first time. Mm-hmm. Do um do you buy the items? Yes, we do. Yeah. So, so no one's giving you these things to tear apart. Uh, yeah, o- almost all the time uh we're we're going out and buying them. Sometimes uh uh like with the with the pebble, I think they wanted to, us to get, get in early, so they they sent us one early, but o- almost all of the time we're out there buying it ourselves. We don't get help from the manufacturers. Very cool. And and kind of my final question is, uh, I suggested repairing a battery on a phone, but what, what's a good starter fix if you've never really taken something apart? Uh, I think fixing a battery or swapping out a screen on a phone is a great start. It really depends on the phone. Like, I wouldn't do that on an HTC One, mm-hmm. but on an iPhone or a Samsung S5, like, absolutely get in there. Uh, S4. S4. The S, not the S5. The S5 got harder. Um, yeah, you know, there's a lot of things. I mean, sometimes it's like, just pick something that you have that doesn't work. So I would look around your house and pick something that's broken and mm. do that because it doesn't really matter if it's already broken and you take it apart and you try to fix it. And at the end, it does it still doesn't work. Uh, you didn't really lose anything. That's a good attitude. That's, I mean, that's ultimately how I think most of us started. I think the first thing I ever took apart was a remote control. And then I went up to the, uh, the legendary clock radio telephone. Right. And once I got that working, then right. I was like, I'm, I can take apart anything. Right. And you just kind of work your way through it. And I mean, that's, I mean, there's a joy of tinkering and getting inside these things. We'll do events, uh, with middle schoolers and we'll say, Hey, do you want to take this iPod apart? And they look at us like we're crazy because every adult in their life has been telling them, don't take things apart. And we say, no, it's okay. Take it apart. And once they, they get past their fear, they start to get inside their eyes, just light up and they can't stop and they never leave. Uh, so, Very so cool. that's, we need to get back to a society where we, where we understand and enjoy tinkering. Uh, I think it will lead us to make better purchasing decisions up front. And it'll also, I think, probably lead to better public policy down the road. You know, and I obviously will echo that and suggest that one of the things that I do with my kids all the time, and I recommend to, to all parents, if you've got, if you've got kids or if you're a, an uncle or an aunt, go to a Goodwill or a, a, uh, you know, anywhere, a swap meet that you can find broken stuff. Get your kid a Leatherman tool, mm-hmm. find an item, and just let them take it apart. Right. Just let them literally just rip the thing apart, even if they have to break the plastic and just, just, you know, just destroy it. Okay. Then work your way up to taking it apart gracefully and then fix the thing. Exactly. That's exactly right. And, and it's a, such an amazing experience for kids and to be able to get, you know, get inside and understand, oh, that's how it works. Oh, there's a battery inside. Wow. I didn't no idea. It's, it's a, it's a wonderful process. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and it develops skills that will save you money down the road. Very cool. Kyle Weens, thanks so much for talking to me today. Thank you. 
This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. 